Uh, last week I asked you to pray for um, Pastor Tom Herzl and his wife, and uh, she's been battling cancer for a number of years, and uh, you may have heard, I told this in Sunday school, but in case you haven't heard, Mrs. Herzl uh, went to heaven on, on Friday night, and so pray for the Herzl family, family, if you would, please. She had three grown children. And uh, they are all three married and have children of their own. And they're all, they all went out there to California to be with her. But she passed away on Friday night. And uh, please keep them in your prayers. Genesis chapter 12. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, please bless today. And as we begin the service, I want to pray for Brother Tom and his children, his grandchildren. Lord, in their, in their heartache. I pray that you would encourage them, help them, bless them, meet their needs, give them wisdom as they uh, make a lot of decisions. I pray that you would give them your comfort most of all and be with them in in their hardship, I pray. Bless as we look into your word. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for all that it means to me and has meant to me. And Lord, I pray, I pray that your precious Holy Spirit would enable me to bring it to life for the people here. Lord, I pray that every believer in this room would go home with a greater hunger for your word than they had when they came. I have no doubt that many people in the room already have a wonderful relationship with your word. But it can always be stronger. It can always be stronger in my heart. And I pray that you would strengthen our heart relationship with the scriptures this morning. Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. David said in Psalm 119 verse 42, I trust In thy word. You read those words a few minutes ago. I trust in thy word. Last week we talked about trusting the Lord. This morning I want to talk to you about trusting the Lord's word. You can't trust in the Lord without trusting his word. And when you're trusting his word, you're trusting him. The... The words of God not only were given to men of God who wrote them down exactly as God wanted them written down, but they have been preserved for you over these centuries in spite of before the printing press being copied by hand over and over and over again, in spite of being translated into all kinds of languages, the Lord has made sure that his words have been preserved for us. Now, I should warn you, Satan has made sure that some corruption has been sprinkled in there. Say, well, then how do I know? Go with the one with the track record. Whatever language you speak and read, there's there's a Bible in your language that has a track record. Go with the one with the track record. But you have in your lap, A copy of God's preserved word. That's how much he cares about you. To make sure that you have his word. You can't trust in the Lord without trusting his word. And when you're trusting his word, you're trusting him. So last week I encouraged you to ask the question, do I trust the Lord? This morning I want to urge you to ask the question, do I trust his words? Do I trust his promises? Do I trust his principles? Listen to some verses that speak of trusting the Lord and trusting his word interchangeably. It doesn't make the distinction. It just assumes that if you trust God, you trust his word. And if you trust his word, you trust him. 2 Samuel 22, 31. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. 
He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. So it talks about the word of the Lord having been put to the test and stood the test. And then it says, he is a buckler. It is just assumed that the man who trusts the Lord trusts the Lord's word. And it's just assumed that in order to put your trust in him, you have to put your trust in his word. That same statement, almost word for word, is found in Psalm 18, verse 30. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. Psalm 56, verse 4, what I'm showing you again is that it is just assumed that if you trust in the Lord, you trust his word. And that if you trust his word, you're trusting him. Psalm 56, verse 4. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. So there you have the clear implication that if you're trusting God, you are trusting his word. And if you're trusting his word, you're trusting him. Psalm 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. So the beginning of the verse, it begins by talking about God's word. It ends by talking about trusting him. And it is just assumed that if you trust God, you trust his word. If you trust his word, you're trusting him. I trust in thy word. If you don't trust God's words, you don't trust God. It is essential that you have both a loving and trusting relationship with God's words. If, if your mind is occupied with, how do I know this is God's word? Then I urge you to fight that battle. Don't just take my word for it. I fought that battle on my knees reading through my Bible when I was 14, 15, 16 years old. The Lord persuaded me. You have to seek him. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And if you're asking those questions, how do I know that this book is God's words to me? I could preach a 10-week series on how I know, evidences and so forth. That still wouldn't change your mind until you decide to do the search before God. God, show me. If you are real and this is your book, then you have to show me if you want me to believe it. So that sounds disrespectful. No, that's dead on. If God is real, and he is, and if this is his word, and it is, it's up to him to prove it to you. But it's up to you to seek him. So if that's where you are, I urge you, do the work before God. You're a fool to believe in the Bible if it's not God's word. But you're a fool to not believe in the Bible if it is his word. So one way or the other, you have the potential of totally throwing your life away. Of ignoring God's word if it's his word. Or of embracing it if it's not. You better find out. You better find out. So if that's where you are, I urge you to do that work. But let's move beyond that to those of you that say, no, the Bible's God's word. I know that. I have no doubt about it. Then I want to talk to you this morning about trusting God's word, not as a whole, though you ought to trust it as a whole. But what I want to talk to you about is trusting the individual statements. You know when I really got sal uh, assurance of my salvation? When I learned to trust the individual statements of God's words. God's words. I became convinced as I sought the Lord that this book is God's words. Not just his word as a whole, but the individual words came from God to me the way he wants me to have them. And then I began to take the promises of God's word, memorize them, 
And it has been the foundation upon which I have labored to build my life. Before I give you some examples of that, I want to show you somebody who did exactly what we're talking about. And he didn't have a Bible. He didn't have a Bible. The first Bible book to be written was the book of Job. And I believe that Moses wrote the book of Job. There'd be some that disagree. It doesn't matter. But the reason that it is important is to understand that Moses, if he did write it, wrote it before he wrote the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Abraham lived before any of that. It's possible that Abraham was a contemporary of Job. It's possible. But even if he was, he didn't have the book of Job. So Abraham had no Bible. He had no written word. And yet he is the model of faith for us. Abraham built his whole life on the words that God spoke to him. I don't know if God spoke audibly to him where he could hear with his ears. Some say he did. Some say he didn't. Or maybe God spoke so powerfully in Abraham's heart that he knew exactly what God was saying. My opinion, I believe he could hear God speak. But one thing for sure, Abraham knew he was receiving God's words. You're in Genesis chapter 12, and I want to look at what uh, and I'm going to walk you through a couple of passages, and I hope you find this as fascinating as I do. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land which I will show thee. Now look at verse 2. And I will make of thee a great nation. I will make of thee a great nation. This is the word at 75 years old, Abraham was, that God gave to him that he built his whole life upon. Everything he did from that day forward was built on the foundation of God saying, I will make of thee a great Nation. Now, of course, there are a lot of questions that that doesn't answer. How? When? Where? God didn't really give him many details. He gave him that one promise. I will make of thee a great nation. Everything that Abraham did for years after that was built on that one promise. I will make of thee a great nation. About 10 years went by. And not much had changed in Abraham's circumstance. His wife was 10 years younger than he was. They had never had any children. They were unable to have children. And now their past childbearing age, his wife is past childbearing age. And yet he's still living his life based on the promise for 10 years. For 10 years. Imagine living your life for the last 10 years based on one promise from God. He gets to be about 85 years old. He's still living on, I will make of thee a great nation. Turn over to chapter 15, just a couple of pages. Chapter 15 and verse number 2. Abraham has been living on that one promise for 10 years. I will make of thee a great nation. And so Abraham's talking to God again. And look what he says, verse 2. And Abram said, Lord God. What wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given me no seed, no offspring, no children. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. So, God gave him this promise, I will make of thee a great nation. He's been working off that promise for ten years. And now one day he's talking to God and he says, uh, Lord, can I ask you something? You said, I, I will make of you a great nation. You didn't tell me how. And I was thinking, 
I've got this servant. He's the steward of my whole everything, my, every, all my property, all everything I own. He oversees it all for me. So if I were to die today, he would legally be my heir if I, if I made it that. So I was thinking, is he going to be the one that you make a great nation out of? And God said in verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Wow, he's, he's got, he has new perspective, new insight on the promise. God's going to make of me a great nation. I've been wondering for 10 years what that means. But I've been operating on that word for 10 years. So I asked him for more insight. And now he tells me he's going to make a great nation out of me from my own offspring. Well, that's good to know. Very clearly he went and he told Sarah, hey, I got an update from God. And by the way, Sarah was not a skeptic. She believed God like Abraham did. The book of Hebrews tells us that. He said, I've got an up update from the Lord. God's going to make a great nation out of us. And it's going to be by our offspring. Wow. Okay. That, that blows my mind because, I mean, look at us. You're 75 or you're 85. I'm 75. But Okay. That starts to churn in Sarah's mind. And turn over to chapter 16. So Sarah's thinking, all right, he's going to make a great nation out of us. And it's going to be Abraham's offspring. That's the way she took it. It's going to be Abraham's offspring. So she comes up with an idea. Abraham had an idea based on the first promise. Now that there's new insight, she comes up with an idea. Look at chapter 16, verse 1. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. Well, if you know the story, you know that that didn't turn out so good. It wasn't a great idea. Obviously, it wasn't a good idea morally to begin with. But he goes with Hagar. Hagar has a child. The child's name is Ishmael. So now, at 87 years old, Abraham has offspring. And now for the next 13 years, actually 12 years, he's left to wonder. So is this it? Is my son, he's watching him grow three years old, seven years old, 10 years old, 12 years old. Is this the offspring? I mean, God said he's going to make a great nation out of me. I'm, I'm hanging on to that pro promise. And he said, I'm going to use your own offspring. Well, this is my offspring. Is this, is this, the, is this the fulfillment of God's promise? He's in uncertainty. He has to question. He has to wonder. By the way, he put himself in that position. Notice when Sarah had the idea of going into Hagar. There's no record that Abraham went to the Lord and said, God, you got to show me. Is this the right thing to do? He didn't. He didn't ask the Lord. He just went ahead with Sarah's idea. After, turn to chapter 17. After 12 years of uncertainty and assumption. You know, I'm, I assume this is the fulfillment of God's promise. Look at chapter 17, verse 15. God's talking to Abraham again, and God said unto Abraham, As for Sarah thy wife, let's go with uh, Sarai, so you understand the verse. As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed, and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And look at what he says. 
Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. What is he saying? I thought the son that I had was the fulfillment of, I will make a great nation out of you, and it shall be of your offspring. And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And are you ready? Here's another piece of the puzzle. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. All right, so now another, the, the picture's coming together here. God is giving to Abraham one piece of information at a time. And he's living for years off of these pieces of information. Now, I don't mean to get to the end too soon. But do you know, he does the same with you. If you're in that book. Do you know, the Lord shows me things now that would have made no sense to me when I was 18. But they are built on the foundation of the things that he showed me when I was 18. So there's things now that I could not possibly learn if I hadn't been in the word of God when I was 13 and 14. Do you know this morning I reviewed a passage of scripture in, well, out loud, sort of mumbling while I was getting ready. I reviewed a passage of scripture that I began memorizing when I was 13 years old. All these years later, 40 years later, and the Lord's still building on the foundation that he laid with me all those years ago. He laid the foundation. He's still building upon it. If you're not in God's word, he cannot build the foundation and he cannot build upon the foundation. It's so vital, indispensable that you have a relationship with God's word. If you don't have a relationship with God's word, you don't have much of a relationship, maybe not any relationship with God himself. So God laid the foundation for Abraham. I will make of thee a great nation. I will make, build this nation off of your own offspring. And no, it's not going to be the son that you schemed to have. It's going to be the son that I ordained. Miraculous. Could only happen with me doing it. So, Sarah has Isaac. And immediately after Isaac is born, there's conflict between Sarah and Hagar. And Sarah goes to Abraham and says, she's got to go. She and her kid have got to go. Abraham doesn't want Ishmael to leave. Why? Because he's his offspring. And he worked for 12 years. He worked off of that promise. And even in spite of what he's now learned about Isaac, he still has 12. You know, when you believe something for 12 years, it's pretty hard to just let go of like that. And he says, I've been believing for 12 years that my offspring, Ishmael, is going to be the fulfillment of the promise I will make of thee a great nation. How can I let him just walk away? Look at verse, uh, chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 21. Turn over to chapter 21. And stay with me because how this ends is just absolutely phenomenal. I don't want you to miss it. Chapter 21. And verse 9, so the, the story that I just told you, you're going to see spelled out here in verse 9 and 10 through 12. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. So the 12-year-old son of Abraham was psh, disregarding the newborn son of Sarah. She saw him mocking. Wherefore, she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight. Because of his son, not because of Hagar, because of his son. How can I say to my son who I have loved and nurtured for 12 years? You got to leave. By the way, the pain that was caused there was because of Abraham and Sarah's own decision. 
See, a lot of the pain that we blame on God is really of our own making. But look at verse 12. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of the bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. Now here's the final piece of the great nation puzzle. Ready? For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Bang. Now, before he was born, the Lord just about said that, but here it is in one concise promise. And Abraham would operate in the rest of his life. By the way, Abraham would dissect that statement like we're supposed to dis dissect the word of God. Did you ever hear somebody study the word of God and they, oh, they're this scripture and this scripture and going back here and comparing this with this and, and you go, I think you're getting a little bit carried away. Now, if you're taking something out of context and you're twisting something, yeah, they, they're, they're out of bounds. But I'm talking about, wow, you've got this whole structure of doctrine based upon all these verses put together. And yes, it makes sense. And yes, they fit. But man, you're wearing me out. Just give me the bottom line. But Abraham dissected that statement, as I'm going to prove to you in a minute from one more verse. God wants us to treat his word that way. He wants us to dig deep to, to get our, 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 wrap our brains around it, wrap our hearts around it, to dig, dig deep into his word, to understand it, and dig deep roots in the word of God. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. So here's the, here's the building here of promises that Abraham was saying. He didn't have a Bible. He was basing his life on, I will make a great nation out of thee. That nation will come from your own offspring, not some guy that works for you, from your own offspring. It won't come through your scheming. It will come from the son that I give you between you and Sarah. And here's the final summary touch that Abraham would focus on for the rest of his days in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Say that with me, ready? In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Abraham lived the rest of his life trusting that word from the Lord. Now, when Isaac was a man, and I believe he was in his 30s, and I believe I can give you pretty good proof of that from the Bible. When Isaac was a man, God asked of Abraham the biggest thing he had ever asked. And I think the biggest thing he's ever asked of any human being. And something that he only required of himself, by the way. God required of it of himself. If you know the story, you know what I mean. Genesis 21, turn over there. Genesis 21 and verse number 1. I'm sorry, 22, 22. Genesis 22 and verse number 1. Genesis 22, verse number 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Now that word, by the way, doesn't mean tempt to do evil. James says that God never tempts anyone to do evil, but it was a test. And don't forget, when God tests us to get us to do right, Satan is using that same thing to get us to do wrong. So in that sense, it is temptation. God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And the Lord said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. He said, Wait a second. Sounds like he's telling Abraham to kill his son. That's exactly what he's telling him to do. Now, as you know, they went to the spot. And Abraham brought everything that he needed to present a sacrifice. And as they're walking up the hill, his grown son, Isaac, says, Dad, you brought everything but, but, a, but an animal. 
And Abraham said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. They get up there, they lay out the altar. He takes a knife in his hand, lays Isaac down the altar, and with his hand and the knife raised over his head, God says, stop! The angel of the Lord says, take your son off the altar. This was just a test. But look over there in their bushes, and there's, a, there's an animal caught in the bushes. Take him and sacrifice him unto the Lord. Now listen, that test was as much for Abraham as it, for Isaac as it was for Abraham. That's a different subject for a different day. Here's what I don't want you to miss. Here's the question. How did Abraham have such peace in obeying God? I mean, it didn't even seem to phase him. How did he so readily get everything together and make the journey to sacrifice? Isaac turned to Hebrews chapter 11 because it gives us the answer. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, of course, is the faith chapter, and Abraham is a huge part of it. Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 17, 18, and 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Of whom it was said that, and read the rest of the verse with me. Ready? In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. From whence also he received him in a figure. Now the last part of the the verse means Abraham was practically dead when he and Sarah had him. There's a little bit of a joke there from the Lord. But the other factor was, Abraham said, if I do kill my son, God's obligated to raise him from the dead. Why? Because of that statement that he'd been hanging on for 20 years. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Because he he clung to that with all of his might. In Isaac, and in his mind, he pondered it, he dissected it, he considered all of the implications of it. When you read the New Testament and it quotes the Old Testament, you will find that the New Testament validates taking God's words and putting our whole trust in them. Jesus used words, for example, to prove his resurrection. That you might have looked at that Old Testament verse and said, I'm not sure that we can put all of our weight on thinking that that's what it means. But Jesus did because he used those very verses to prove that the Old Testament said that he was going to rise from the dead. And there are many examples of that. There are many examples of that by the Apostle Paul. In other words, here's the Old Testament scripture that proves this to be true. And the only way you can think that that Old Testament verse says that is if you put your whole hope and trust in every word of it. And soak it up for all that it's worth. God wants you to soak up his word for all that it's worth. To study it, ponder it, get squeeze everything out of it that you can in the larger Bible context and put your whole confidence in it. And so when God said, Abraham, take your son and offer him as a sacrifice, he didn't hesitate. He obeyed. Why? Because in Isaac shall thy... St- In Isaac shall thy seed be called. He can't die or he can't stay dead. Because God made me a promise. That's how much confidence Abraham had in the word of the Lord. And that's how much you need to trust the word of the Lord. God, let me give me me five minutes and we'll close up with this. But listen carefully. God will lead you to trust individual passages of his word. Listen to Psalm 119 verse 49. 
Remember the word unto thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope. David is reminding the Lord that throughout his life, God has given him passages from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That was the Bible he had, and Job, and caused him to put his hope in those passages. And now he's reminding the Lord, I'm counting on you. I'm counting on your word. Remember the word unto thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope. And God will lead you. God has led you to trust individual passages of his word. The scriptures that are dear to you, that have become dear to you in your lifetime, they are your personal spiritual journey. Nobody else has the spiritual journal that you have. If I asked you, how do you know you're saved? You would give different verses than other people would give. Why? Because the Lord used those verses in your life. For me, one of those verses was John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I took God at his word and said, I am believing on Jesus for my salvation. He promises that I have everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. That's not me. I have not rejected Jesus Christ as the Son of God, dying for my sins and rising from the dead. That verse is special to me. God gave it to me. He caused me to build my assurance on it. What verse are you resting upon? God very early on taught me the verse, Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, what the basic needs of life shall be added unto you. You put God first, he will take care of you. And God taught me early on to rest on that promise. What are some verses that he has given you? What are the promises? Listen, that's more. You didn't just go to your Bible and mine that out. You had to do the work, but God gave that to you. What are they? Make a list of them to remind yourself, Lord, this is my spiritual journey. This is my walk with you all these years, and you have caused me to hope. I have trusted in your word. What are they? What are those promises? What are those principles? Proverbs chapter 4, 7 is a huge part. Of my spiritual journey. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting get understanding. That's a part of my spiritual DNA. God gave that to me. Through my Christian school principal. When I was a teenager. And I have clung to that for all these years. I've told you the story of Romans 6. In my life. And how I've used that. Thousands of times. To fight off temptation. And get focused again on the cross. Or stay focused on the cross. When I was ready to leave college and start a church. God gave me in class one day Isaiah 58, 12. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repair of the breach. The restorer of paths to dwell in. Oh, I was in class. The class was called Keys to Great Men. And we were studying Isaiah 58. And that verse just jumped off the page of the Bible. I started taking it to my prayer closet. I started uh, putting it, I put it on my prayer list and I would bring it to the Lord. My wife, maybe it, it's faded now because it's, it's decades old. But she took it and she uh, made a verse out of it because she knew how special the verse was to me. I have a map that I've showed you before of the Hudson Valley. And uh, from, from, I cut it out of an out, atlas. I bought the atlas, cut the page out, threw the atlas away. And I used it as my prayer list. And on the back of it, I wrote Isaiah 58, 12. Why? Because God gave that to me. He caused me to trust in it. After I'd become pastor and I'd have stretches, I still have stretches where I go, Lord, it doesn't seem like I'm accomplishing what I want to accomplish. And he reminds me, John 15, 5, I am the vine. 
ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. These statements are as much mine as I will make a great nation out of thee was to Abraham. As in Isaac shall thy seed be called was to Abraham. I'm not saying I have the faith of Abraham. I'm saying they are as much given to me by God personally as those statements were given to Abraham personally. My question to you, what are the words of scripture that you are trusting? What are the words of scripture that you're building your life upon, that you proceed upon, that you're focused upon, that keeps you believing and trusting and following? What are they? Are you tracking them? Are you looking for them? Don't just open up that Bible and say, okay, Zechariah chapter one, check, chapter two, check, chapter three, check. I did it. You go looking every day. Every day is not going to be a monumental day life-changing, you know, whole life-changing day in the scriptures. Every day is not going to be. Most days, God's going to just give you what you need for that day. But man, once in a while, once in a while, something will explode off the page and into your heart and you will proceed for the rest of your life based on one more building block. I trust in thy word. Father, I pray that you'd help us today. Teach us what it means to trust in your word. To trust in your word. Lord, please, I need to trust in your word more. There have been days in my life, just a few, where all I had was your word. And I believe a couple of times it kept me alive. I pray that you would teach me, please, to trust your word more. Teach us, Lord, to have a spiritual journey of trusting your word. Please teach us what that means, how to do it. Please, Lord, I pray. Please bless, please teach us to trust in your word. Heads bowed and eyes closed. And I say to you this morning, the first thing you have to trust about the word of the Lord is his promises regarding eternal life. And I gave you one. He that believeth on the son hath everlasting life. That means that even though we have rebelled against God, we are sinners, we are liars, we are haters, we are lusters, we are disobeyers, we are sinners in God's sight. And that must be punished. God cannot let sinners into heaven. We must go to the place of punishment that he prepared for Satan. That's a reality. That's true. But Jesus fixed that. Now, he died on the cross so that you could be forgiven. And he rose from the dead. Death has been conquered. But now he extends to you the invitation and says, will you believe on Jesus who died for you? And if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, I beg you to do that this morning. To say to the Lord, God, I know I've sinned against you. I'm sorry. I want to be forgiven. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me and rose from the dead. And I make him my savior. It's, it's a simple decision of acknowledging your sin and turning to Christ for salvation. Have you ever done that? If you have not, I beg you. To take care of that with God right now. Talk to God and tell him, dear God, I know I have sinned against you. I'm sorry. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead. And right now I'm taking Jesus as my savior. Jesus, come into my life. Save my soul. Help me to know you. And take me to heaven when I die. If you're here this morning and you never made that decision before today, but you did just now. I would love to know about it. Nobody's looking but me. If you just told Jesus you're making him your savior, would you raise your hand high in the air so I could see that? Lord, I see no hands. I pray that means that everybody here is saved. Lord, when I face you, one of the things I want to be true is that I gave everyone an opportunity to trust Christ. And I pray that you would help us to be certain that our faith is in Jesus Christ. Now, if you know Christ is your Savior, would you pray this simple prayer? Lord, teach me to trust your word more. Teach me to trust your word more. Father, help us, please, 
to have a stronger relationship with your word than we have ever had and to trust it more than we ever have. Please, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All righty. We're going to take our Sunday morning offering. And uh, I have a couple of announcements. I, I guess I'm going to remember them. I don't know what I do on my sheet. But a um, couple of things. Listen carefully because one of these is brand new. All right. So uh, we, we need a, um, a road trip vehicle in our fleet. We bought the red van in 2014, and it's been very good to us. But now it's got over 100,000 miles on it, and um, it, is, it is basically, it's safe, but it's not a trip that I'm ready to take to, you know, uh, to New Jersey or in our trips there or anything like that. Uh, I would if I had to. It's, it's safe. It's dependable. But we need a new or a newer road trip vehicle. So. First thing we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to uh, consider uh, giving to a, a it's not, we're not trying to buy it in April or anything. We're just going to start saving. So as you give, I'm going to ask you to uh, uh, consider designating every week or now and then as you're able to a few dollars here, a few dollars there designated to the uh, church van. We'll have it if you do by if you do by text. We'll have a new category on there that just says church van, and you can give uh, uh, an additional amount to that. Please don't ever give your tithe to a special offering. The tithe is what uh, pays the bills. But um, if you would give extra towards that, now I'm going to go a step farther with a wonderful announcement followed by a request. The wonderful announcement is you have been so generous with the radio broadcast. This has never been true in January of any year since the, in the, in the uh, uh, going on 14 years of the radio broadcast. The entire month of 2023, the broadcast is paid for because you've been so generous. Yes, praise the Lord. Now, that's not just because of the Christmas offering, but because we have folks who give generously to the radio broadcast every Sunday. I am scared to death to turn that spigot off. You know what I mean? All right, you don't have to give again until next year. And you know what I'm saying? Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you are currently giving regularly towards the radio broadcast, thank you so much. You're, you're a huge part of the reason that we are able to say, 2023 is paid for. Um, but would you consider giving at least half of that amount, whatever amount you give on a, on a weekly basis to the radio, would you consider, since we are paid through the end of December, would you uh, consider giving at least half of that amount towards the church van project? So that maybe by... May or, or, I'm sorry, yeah, May or June, maybe we are in a position to look at and say, okay, we can, we can shop for a van. Maybe not that soon. Maybe it's the end of the year. I don't know. But would you consider, if you already give to the radio, giving at least half of that amount instead designating to, towards the church van? Pray about that. Do as the Lord shows you. And uh, I'm excited that uh, we're going to tackle this project this year. Uh, I would like to get one of those sleek, you know, uh, uh, you know what I'm saying, uh, the, the, what do they call them, Joe? What are they? The, the uh, transit? Sprinter. Tran yeah, sprinter. Ooh, a sprinter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's up to all of us how much we're, we're willing to put into the project. All right, the other thing is February 12th, 13th, and 14th, Dr. and Mrs. Ray Young will be with us Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And so uh, we look forward to that. If you're able to give a few dollars towards that, that will help us with their airfare, with their motel, and taking good care of them while they're here. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here today. Brother Joey's going to come and close the service out for us. Let's stand together again and let's sing complete in D. Let's sing the last verse. Think about the words and let's praise the Lord together again, church. Ready? Dear Savior, when before thy bar all tribes and tongues assembled are, thy chosen will I be 
at thy right hand, complete in thee. Yea, justified, O blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath poured and bought for me. Let's sing that chorus one more time to the Lord. Yea, justified, O blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath poured and bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Father, thank you for meeting with us this morning. Thank you for that great message. Would you please keep us safe on our way home? In Jesus' holy name, amen. God bless you, church. Have a great day.